Good morning, I will see. Uh, my name is um, Joshua Oyogi. I serve as one of the pastors in this church. If you're, you know, watching us for the very first time, Kariboni Sana, we are glad that you're here. And so my task today is to share from Exodus chapter 9, chapter 7 rather, um, all the way to chapter 10, verse 20, Exodus chapter 7, verse 9, all the way to chapter 10, verse 20. So I'll read um, a short portion of scripture because that's, those are so many um, verses to read. And because of time and for the sake of the recording, I'm just going to read a little bit of the verses. And so I read Exodus seven fourteen, 14, uh, all the way to 19. Then we'll just go right ahead and share God's word. Let me read. Exodus seven fourteen to 19. Then the Lord said to Moses, Pharaoh's heart is hardened, he refuses to let the people go. Go to Pharaoh in the morning as he's going out of the water. Stand on the bank of the Nile to meet him. And take in your hand the staff that turned into serpent. And you shall say to him, The Lord, the God of Hebrews, sent me to you, saying, let my people go, that they may serve me in the wilderness. But so far you have not obeyed. Thus says the Lord, by this you shall know that I am the Lord. Behold, with the staff that is in my hand, I will strike the water that is in the Nile, and it shall turn into blood. The fish in the Nile shall die, and the Nile will stink. And the Egyptians will grow weary of drinking water from the Nile. And the Lord said to Moses, say to Aaron, talk your, say to Aaron take your staff and stretch out your hand over the waters of Egypt, over their rivers, their canals, and their ponds, and all their pools of water, so that they may become blood. And there shall be blood throughout the land of Egypt, even in the vessels of wood, in the vessels of stone. God, we pray that even as we share your word um, this morning, we pray that, Lord, your word will teach us, correct us, rebuke us, and train us, so that, Lord, we can be thoroughly equipped uh, for your work. God, we pray that, Lord, you make us what we are not. Transform us into the image of your Son, Jesus Christ, through, uh, the, through the reading of your word and also through just listening into your word in this sermon. So, Father, we exalt you and we honor you for who you are. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So, my sermon today uh, comes from Exodus chapter 7, verse 9. All the way to 10 verse 20. Now I'll not be in a position to go verse by verse systematically but I'll try to bring out the main themes uh, that are in play in these three chapters. Now the author of this book aims to respond to one question. Who is the Lord? And my sermon, my sermon will be summarized in three uh, subheadings or topics. Now God is sovereign over other gods and when we talk about God in this case is Yahweh. Then the second um, topic or title will be God is sovereign over Pharaoh or over kings and then the third will be humankind is responsible or humans are responsible for their actions. So God brought the plagues to Egypt as judgment to them. Now in this world of modern fiction it is important for us to understand that this was literal. These plagues actually did happen. They were not just mere symbols. The plagues God brought against Egypt had a definite strategy and purpose. Each of them confronts and attacks a prized Egyptian god. And so in Exodus chapter 5 verse 20, um, Pharaoh asks this question, Who is the Lord that I should obey his voice to let the Israelites go? And the Lord responds to this question with a series of, pl of plagues. Responds to Pharaoh with a series of plagues. So the plagues show that God is greater than any other gods, including the Egyptian gods. I'll briefly go through each of the plague and the God associated with it. Now, the first plague, God turns uh, Nile into blood, the river Nile into blood. The Nile was worshipped as a God by the Egyptians. Some people say that they even sang and wrote hymns uh, that were dedicated to the worship of river Nile. God shows his complete power over the Nile by actually turning the water into blood. The second plague, God says, I'll smite all the territories with frogs. Now, the Egyptian, to the Egyptians, God was, uh, frogs were kind of sacred. Okay, frogs were actually not supposed to be killed. But God gave them a plague of frogs. It's kind of God duplicated their gods and killed them. So God shows that he's sovereign over that particular God. 
And this God was called Heket. It was, it was a goddess called Heket. Then the third plague, God says to Aaron, stretch your rod and strike the dust of the land so that it may become lies through the land of Egypt. Now, this plague strike at the heart of all Egyptian worship because for the Egyptians, priesthood was extremely, uh, the priests were supposed to be extremely clean. And so having a lot of dust, this kind of prohibited them from worshiping God and offering their sacrifices. Then the fourth flock, this shows that the point of this plague was probably the same as the plague of the lies. The Egyptians God could not be worshipped amidst this uncleanliness. The fifth plague, God said that disease on livestock and all the livestock of Egypt died. Now in this plague, God struck an Egyptian God called Hathor who was thought to be a mother goddess in the form of a cow. So the Egyptian religion considered kettles as sacred. And so the cow was kind of a symbol of fertility. Now, in this particular plague, notice that God destroyed the livestock for the Egyptians, but not for the Israelites. And God here makes a distinction. He doesn't destroy the livestock of Israel because Israel is his chosen, is his chosen nation. They are his chosen people. And that's why he says, let my people go. Kind of making a distinction. Do you remember in Genesis? Um, I'll put an enmity between you and the woman, her offspring and your offspring. God is kind of making that distinction between his people and um, the other people, the people of the world. And today, church is one of those distinctions that God has actually created. We are chosen people. We are a royal priesthood. Okay, Peter states that very clearly. And so we are not of this world, even though we are in this world. We are set apart to be holy, vessels of honorable use, not of dishonorable use. So when God saves us, we become different. Our desires are changed. Our hopes are changed. The inclination of our hearts are, are gravi gravitate towards him. And so, young people, don't be afraid to be different in school because of your identity in Christ. Because that's the sole reason why God created us. In Ephesians, he says that he created us to make us holy and blameless. And so we are supposed to be different from the world. There is distinction. And I know we are living in a world where um, exclusion is a big deal. Everyone needs to be included in something. But it is right there in the scriptures that God chose a people for himself. God chose a nation for himself. And that nation was Israel. And God is bringing plagues with the desire or with the aim of actually rescuing his people. And so the sixth plague, God caused boils to break out in sores on man and beast. It is said that this plague was probably directed against an Egyptian god called Imhotep, who was said to be the god of medicine. Unfortunately, the god of medicine could not heal the same people who were very close to him, and that were the magicians, because it was considered that the magicians were uh, assumed to be the closest to this god but their God could not heal them. The seventh plague was the plague of hell. Now it is said this plague was directed against several Egyptians' God. One of them was Nat, who was supposed to be the goddess of the sky, but who could not prevent the hell from coming down. The eighth plague was the plague of the locusts. The locusts uh, ate every herb of the land and all the fruit of the trees, which hell had left behind. Now, Yahweh showed himself to be greater than the Egyptian god called Set, who thought to be the protector of crops. But in this particular case, he could not protect the crops because our God was sovereign and he actually destroyed the crops. So, Christians, this Yahweh, this God is a jealous God. He cannot share his glory with any other God. Anything that you value more than God is your idol, is my idol. The Lord will expose and topple every false God in our hearts. Just like the children of Israel, God desires us. God wants us to serve him alone. And he will and must destroy all false gods because he is a holy God and he does not condone sin. Our idols are not necessarily bad things. On the contrary, our idols are good things. These are things that God has graciously given us. Unfortunately, our hearts bow down to worship the fleeting glory of these idols instead of bowing down to the omnipotent God in his perpetual glory. Now, sin plays havoc with our spiritual vision of who the Lord is and what he has done. 
God is not only bigger than gods, but is also bigger than the magicians. When you read Exodus 18, 19, it says, the magicians tried by their secret arts to produce nuts, but they could not. Now, behind their secret arts is the power of Satan. Let's not be anxious when see the devil creating havoc in the lives of Christians. He has the power to tempt, yes, to deceive, to deceive and to accuse, but he cannot create or redeem. And the magicians actually realized that they could not uh, perform the miracle. They could not replicate what Aaron and Moses had done. And they said, indeed, this is the finger of God. This is beyond us. That is basically what they were saying. In other words, they were saying God is bigger and stronger and superior than our powers, than the powers of darkness. Kids, we normally think that our God is so big, so strong and so mighty. There is nothing our God cannot do. And that is true. That our God is big and so mighty and there is nothing that he cannot do. The story of the plague is the story of God revealing himself, his essence, his power, his authority to Pharaoh and to all Egyptians and to all men. So God is actually ask, ask, uh, answering this question. I am the Lord God Almighty. I am Yahweh and you will obey me. Church, God is bigger than you. God is bigger than me. God is bigger than COVID. God is bigger than cancer. God is bigger than everything and anything. Don't refute this truth like Pharaoh and reject him. He has not ceased revealing himself. He still does through the scriptures. Hebrews 1 says, Long ago, at many times in many ways, God revealed himself to our fathers by the prophets, but in these latter days he has revealed himself through the Son. This God sent his Son, Jesus Christ. He became flesh, John chapter 1, verse 4, and dwelt amongst us. And he delivered us from the domain and the power of darkness and brought us into his light. He has delivered us from a bigger plague than the plagues of the Egyptians. He has delivered us from the greater plague, and that is his wrath. We deserved to be struck by the wrath of God. But he set his love upon us and acted in grace and sent his son to die for us while we were still sinners. If you have not believed in this Jesus, in this God, can you believe in him today? So we have seen that God is sovereign over gods. Yahweh is sovereign over gods and also supernatural, uh, or also evil evil powers, evil supernatural powers. But God is also sovereign over kings. God is sovereign over Pharaoh. When you read a few chapters and verses carefully, you realize there's a repetition of the statement, as the Lord said. Exodus 7, 13 says, Still Pharaoh's heart, Pharaoh's heart was hardened, and he would not listen to them as the Lord has said. Exodus 7.22 says, But the magicians of Egypt did the same by their secret arts, so Pharaoh's heart remained hardened and would not listen to them as the Lord had said. Exodus 8.15, But when Pharaoh saw that there was a respite, he hardened his heart and would not listen to them as the Lord had said. Exodus 8.19, Then the magicians said to Pharaoh, This is the finger of God, but Pharaoh's heart was hardened and would not listen to them as the Lord had said. Did you get it? There's a repetition as the Lord had said. What is the author trying to point out here? The repetitions of these words, the author is trying to put an emphasis that the hardening of Pharaoh's heart was caused by the Lord. The, Pharaoh's heart, the hardening of Pharaoh's heart was decreed and ordained by God. Actually, the word hardening of Pharaoh's heart has been mentioned 18 times in the book of Exodus. And sometimes this truth that the sovereignty of God and how God hardens human's heart. Sometimes this truth does not make sense to us. We see God as unfair. We see God as a mean God. But sometimes our understanding is limited by our fallenness. Even if we don't fully comprehend it. The Bible is clear and so we can believe in it. We can embrace it. And we need to know this truth. Romans 9.18, Paul says, God has mercy in whoever he, will, who he wants to have mercy, and he hardens whoever he wills. 
Why did God not just wipe Pharaoh out the first time? If God can speak things into existence, he can surely just wipe him out as soon as he can. Why the ten plagues? And Exodus 9, 14 to 16 responds to that question. So that the Lord can actually display his power in him and through him and his might and his name might be proclaimed. And so the hardening of, of Pharaoh's heart was for the glory of God. And so God, think, God does things according to the purpose of his own will. For his glory. And sometimes it may not be necessarily for our good in a human sense. But in God's view, even the sufferings that we go through, they're actually for our good. Even though it may not seem like so at that particular moment. We might be wondering what is the good of this COVID-19. We might not know. But one day we will surely know. And so that was the purpose why God was hardening Pharaoh's heart. But for, us and, but for us and for the Israelites and any person who would fear him, why the ten plagues? Is so that we can actually tell our kids these stories. And that is what the author says in chapter 10 verse 2. That I may show these signs of mine among them. And that you may tell in the hearing of your son and of your grandsons how I have dealt harshly with the Egyptians and what signs I have done among them, that you may know that I am the Lord. Did you get it? That the reason why actually these plagues God had to bring the ten plagues was not only for Pharaoh's sake, but for his sake, so that he can be glorified, and for our sake, so that we can tell this story, so that the children of Israel who who, who were there and experiencing and seeing what the Lord is doing so that they can actually tell their kids and their grandsons and their granddaughters of who the Lord is. Because again, the question God is seeking to respond is, the question God is seeking to respond to, who is the Lord? Believer, do you deliberately teach your kids and grandkids about God's word? Do you tell them of his wondrous works? Do you tell him who God is and what he's like? Do you tell him why we exist, why the church exists, how God became man so that he can take our place and die for our sins? Do you tell them of the things that the Lord has said in the scriptures? Can I challenge us today, families, parents, brothers, sisters, can we pass this story, can we pass God's story to the other generation so that they can know who the Lord is? God is sovereign over any suffering that we are going through right now. So you can trust in his plan because he has, he has orchestrated your suffering for his glory. Can you rest in the fact that all things come to us, not by chance, but from, our, from his fatherly hands? Divine providence is always for us, never against us. It may not make sense to us right now. It may not make sense in this lifetime but it will certainly make sense in the next. Sometimes it is hard to understand God's providence or sovereignty because we live in a man-centered fallen world where God is required to serve men and not the vice versa. We need to realize and acknowledge that God creates and controls the world with his sovereign love and providential power, even in light of hardening Pharaoh's heart even when it comes to hardening someone's heart so that he can be glorified. He is able to do that, and he actually did that, and he still does that. Now, when we look at God's sovereignty through the lens of our fallen nature and idolatrous, idolatrous hearts, we'll always think of God as a mean God. But when we look at his sovereignty through the lens of Scripture, we will see him as a loving Father who cares for us and loves us than that all things are happening together for our good, for our joy, and for his glory. So, God is sovereign over God's and supernatural, evil supernatural powers, or evil powers. God is sovereign over Pharaoh or kings. But now we're going to look at that human beings are also responsible for their actions. Because we have dealt with the issue of God's sovereignty and how he hardens the human heart, it is easy then for us to say, oh, then that means 
I can go on sinning because God has actually hardened my heart. That is true, but it is not the full truth. Because God's sovereignty happens side to side with human responsibility. The text shows that Pharaoh actually hardened his heart. When you look, when you read these chapters, Pharaoh actually hardened his heart. We see statements like Pharaoh would not listen to God. He refuses to let the people go. You have not obeyed. So God's sovereignty is not an excuse for us to act in disobedience. So despite all the evidence that he saw, he refused to believe in God. Even when his servants were in despair and tried to convince him and said, how long shall this man be as near to us? Let the people go so that they may worship the Lord their God. Do you not realize that Egypt is ruined? So even though their hearts had been hardened earlier, they relented in light of the destruction that came upon Egypt. And they are telling Pharaoh, please let these people go. But Pharaoh refused. Chapter 8, verse 8 to 15 says, Then Pharaoh called for Moses and Aaron and said, Entreat the Lord that he may take away the frogs from me and from my people, and I will let the people go, that they may sacrifice to the Lord. But we know what did happen. Pharaoh changed his mind. Pharaoh lied. He did not let the people go. Chapter 9, verse 28 to 32. And Pharaoh said, I will let you go that you may sacrifice to the Lord your God in the wilderness. Only you shall, only you shall not go very far away. Intercede for me. He actually goes ahead and tells Moses to intercede for him. This was a clear promise that he made. But he did not live up to it. Now, just like Pharaoh, a lot of us turn to God in terms of calamity. And when things better, we almost it immediately turn our backs and our hearts away from God. Pharaoh was not an unusual example of humanity. He is like most of us. He is like many of us. We can actually relate with Pharaoh's heart. And Pharaoh's repentance was not genuine. He continued to harden his heart. Despite God's kindness to him and to the Egyptians, Pharaoh continued to harden his heart. And probably you're asking, how was God kind to Pharaoh? There are few times God actually sent a warning to Pharaoh, and that's an indication of God's kindness, God's mercy towards Pharaoh. God was actually giving Pharaoh an opportunity to repent of his sins and let the people of Israel go. Now, as we continue to sin and reject God's opportunities for us to repent, our hardening continues. A man doesn't start, and, and, and we don't start sinning, we don't, we don't, our hearts does not start hardening by, our, by the first sin that we do. Of course, we are sinners, so there is no, you can't even tell at what particular point you start sinning, because from the time you are born, you are actually conceived in sin. But when it's a particular habit, for example, and you sin, that the more you continue sinning, the hardening of your heart continues. And so look at chapter 9, verse 27 to 35. He says, I have sinned this time. Actually, Pharaoh himself confessed and said, I have sinned this time. The Lord is righteous and my people and I are wicked. This sounds like perfect words of repentance from Pharaoh. But true repentance had not worked its way into his heart. Pharaoh was grieved at the consequences of sin, but not at sin itself. When we fail to repent, when God graciously answers our plea, is to ignore his rich mercy. And that is sinful. And so there's, Pharaoh keeps lying and changing his mind, just like we do. In chapter 10, God tells Pharaoh, how long will you refuse to humble yourself before me? And the author wants to bring the issue of pride. The problem with Pharaoh was the pride of life. Pride was the heart of the problem. How long will you refuse to humble yourself before me? 
Is God asking us the same question today? Is God asking me the same question today? Is God asking you the same question today? How long will you refuse to humble yourself before me? The Bible says that God gives grace to the humble, but he opposes the proud. God does not lie. Brothers, sisters, be rest assured that if your heart is filled with pride, God will bring you down. God must bring us down. He will bring us down. Because he says he opposes the proud, but he gives grace to the humble. God acted in mercy towards Pharaoh by telling him what he will do. But Pharaoh did not listen. Sin numbs our conviction. It blinds us. It destroys us. Someone said sin will take you farther than you want to go, keep you longer than you want to stay, and cost you more than you want to pay. That's what sin did to Pharaoh. That's what sin does to us. That's what sin did to Judas. <coughs> sin also makes us think we can deceive God. Do you see how blinding, the blinding effect of sin the same God who created us, the same God who says he searches our hearts and our minds, sin blinds us to that, to that truth that we actually think we can deceive God who can actually see through our motives. A God who can see right through us. But sin kind of tells us, no, 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 you can't deceive God. Look at what Pharaoh says in Exodus 10, 16-17. Then Pharaoh hastily called Moses and Aaron and said, I have sinned against the Lord, your God, and against you. Now, therefore, forgive my sin. Please, only this once, and plead with the Lord, your God, only to remove this death from me. So he went out from Pharaoh and pleaded with the Lord. But all this time, Pharaoh is not genuine. Yes, he's professing, but not practicing. True repentance begs us, true repentance dictates or demands a change of character. Do you remember God saying that to the children of Israel, that you praise me with your lips, but your hearts are so far away from me? That is exactly what is happening. Yes, he repented, but he did not follow through with his actions. Pharaoh was just confessing so that God can avert the consequences. Do you see the similarities between us and Pharaoh? Sometimes we only ask for God's forgiveness, not because we really mean, we mean it, but rather because we just want him to avert the consequences of our sin. Probably, you, probably you're a parent and you have uh, seen this before or you have witnessed this. So your kids does something wrong and they notice that you have seen them by the look on your face. They know, uh, I'm going to receive some thorough beating, but... Because they have realized that they run to you and say sorry. Not because they actually mean it. But they are saying sorry so that they can avert the consequences of their wrongdoing. And that's the same thing we do to God each and every day. That we go to God when we just want him to avert the consequences. And the moment God does that, the moment God forgives us, we go right back to our sin. There's a thin line between regret and repentance. Regret does not have a godly and a spirit-led contrition. You can regret and still repeat the sin again and again. But like I said earlier, repentance demands a change of heart and behavior. So, this means, despite the fact that the Lord had shown who, we, who he was to Pharaoh, Pharaoh actually hardened his heart. God has shown him that is greater than gods, that is greater than evil powers, that is greater than the magicians, that is greater than Pharaoh himself. But Pharaoh had not known the Lord. And the Lord was pleased to show him more. And that's why we'll have the tenth plague, uh, which um, will be talked about next week. So Pharaoh was supposed to treat Israel well for the sake of the Lord. Not so much for the sake of Israel. In the same way, church, we must treat one another 
Yes, for the sake of our brothers and sisters, but ultimately for the sake of the Lord. Do you remember we are members of one body, one baptism, one Lord, one faith? So we ought to treat other members of the church for the sake of the Lord. So that when we do that, we reflect and display his glory. Spurgeon says, Pharaoh increased his guilt. His vows heaped up his transgressions. He forgot his premises, but God did not. They were laid by in store against him. So what is the summary of these two doctrines of God's sovereignty and human responsibility? Because it is clear in this text it shows that the Lord hardened his heart and it also shows, especially for example Exodus 9.34, it says that Pharaoh hardened his heart. Both statements are true and one does not deny the other and the Bible does not seek to resolve this tension. In hardening Pharaoh's heart, God allowed him to have what he sinfully desired, a hard heart against the Lord and his people. And this doctrine is difficult, but the scripture presents both the sovereignty of God and the responsibility of man. And so friends, brothers, sisters, we must affirm this doctrine in our present finite condition and with our limited knowledge, it is impossible to reconcile these two truths, but we must affirm it and believe in it and receive both. Amen. Let's pray. God, we are grateful for your word. Thank you for your faithfulness and for who you are. We pray even as we continue to depend on you. Help us, Lord, not to harden our hearts to your voice, to your word. Help us, Lord, to Reflect and display your glory in what we do, in what we say, in what we think. Thank you for the indwelling Holy Spirit who you sent to us so that he can be our helper. And so God, I pray, convict us of our sins and unrighteousness. And Lord, let us fix our eyes on Jesus, who is the author and perfecter of our faith. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen.